Hey, so uh, welcome to part two in this SDR course, SDR certification. Um, today we're going to talk about what a career path looks like in tech sales. Um, and uh, I'm Samir. I am the founder of uh, Tech Sales Mentors. Um, just to briefly chat about us, we, um, we help people get jobs in tech sales. So we help get you into interviews, um, crush those interviews, and then um, ultimately negotiate offers at, at really great tech companies. So you can learn more about us there. But um, yeah, let's jump into talking about a career path, starting with that SDR, BDR role that you may have heard of, may not have, and um, you know what your career path can look like after that. So I want to start with this, you know, this slide right here. Um, kind of the goal of I've heard this quote of the goal of being an SDR isn't to stay one forever. Um, so this is sort of that entry level role that generally, you know, when you're entering tech sales, you 99% of the cases, you, you'll have to do it. And um, it's a tough, grindy role, but, um, and, and the compensation is decent, but really like the, the goal for you is you're entering this career path so you can have career growth after that. So your compensation can go much higher. You can work on more interesting um, types of problems. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll chat more about that. But that's just something to keep in mind as you think about your job search and and even in interviewing, um, you don't just want to talk about how like, oh, I want to be SDR. You want to talk about your career ambitions after the SDR role. And, you know, you'll you'll get a taste for what what those um, other roles can be. So then you can you can speak about it in your interviews as well. So let's start with this um, SDR role, BDR role. It stands for Sales Development Representative, Business Development Representative. Um, for for uh, our discussion today, you know, you can generally think of these roles the same. Sometimes companies, you know, it just means slightly different responsibilities, but, you know, in general, they're the same thing. Trying to get um, potential customers in the door interested in your company and open to, to talking more. So really with this role, the, the best way I can describe it is it's a very uh, repetitive task execution focused role on a daily basis your goal on a daily basis is to reach out to potential customers and um, and send them messages that get them interested in um, talking to your company. So there'll be slight variations in those messages based on the research you do on this person, on their company, all that kind of stuff. But, um, you know, at times, like, let's say, I'll, I'll say like for me at least, you know, the first six to nine months of the role, it felt like I was still learning a lot. And all of this stuff was new, not only the product, but like how to sell, how to um, like, where do I fit within the organization, how to handle like internal organization dynamics with, you know, my peers. Um, but after that nine month mark, you'll start to, if you're mastering the role, you'll definitely start to feel like the role is getting stale and you're thinking about what's next. Um, so, um, so yeah, so kind of, you know, if you look at the timeline for this role, sort of the promotion path after SDR, BDR, you're in this role for generally a year or two, depending on the company. Sometimes it goes above two years, um, but in general, it's about a year or two. And, um, compensation, um, you know, it's in the range of, uh, 65 to 90 K OTE, OTE, that's just a term in our industry. It means on target earnings. So that that number on target earnings is made up of, of two components. So this first thing is um, the base, right? That's just, you're gonna get paid that every two weeks. Um, you're gonna get paid your salary every two weeks. Um, and so 70% of this compensation here will be um, in base, about 70%, it depends on every organization. Um, thirty percent of it will come on bonus. So bonus is basically how well are you attaining against your quota. So um, let, let's like do an example here. Let's say um, just to make the math easy here. Let's say the OTE for the role is a hundred k, and seventy percent is base, thirty percent is bonus. So seventy um, k base, thirty k bonus. Let's say um, you. Um, you attain 15, uh, sorry, 50% of your quota. Then you'll get paid 50% of your bonus. So instead of being paid 30K, you'll be paid 50K, 15K, sorry. 
and um, let's say you hit 100% of your quota, then um, you'll be paid out your full bonus, right? Because you hit 100% of whatever your quota is. So then you'll be paid 30K in that scenario. Um, and it doesn't get paid like, you know, once a year. Generally, this stuff is tracked on like a monthly basis or a quarterly basis. Um, so it, like you'll get these bonuses in smaller increments. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that's how it works. And... Um, and, uh, yeah, what else do we want to talk about there? You know, I think uh, one thing I want to step back and talk about, actually, is um, this career path, the SDR, BDR career path, and everything I'm talking about after in terms of compensation, this isn't true for, you know, every tech company in the world. So if you watched part one, which is like B2B SaaS and Tech Sales 101, um, and, and if you haven't watched that, like if you're watching this on YouTube, you'll see that in the you know comments. Um, if you're watching this on my site, then um, you'll like see that below this, like part one. Um, so what, what I talk about there is basically that every, every company now wants to be known as a tech company, um, but most of them like will never, uh, will never be, uh, be the tech companies that like you imagine when you think of tech, right? Like, when you think of tech, I, mean, I imagine you think of the biggest tech companies in the world, right? Companies like Facebook, Google, Apple, whatever, so on and so forth. Um, really, like when when we think of um, tech companies that can provide you the compensation I'm going to talk about and the career growth I'm going to talk about, these are companies that are generally funded by the best venture capitalists um, in general. They're headquartered. Doesn't mean they have they do still have remote roles, but they're headquartered in a major uh, tech hub, like San Francisco is an example, New York City, um, Austin, something like that. Um, and um, and yeah, generally when you are backed by the best venture capitalists, that means you generally are getting access to the most funding from those venture capitalists. You are attracting the best talent to your teams. Um, and to attract the best talent in the world, you need to um, pay the best, right? So um, that's something just to keep in mind here is like, um, that's something that's a focus for us at Tech Sales Mentors is we only want to place candidates at these sort of best of breed tech companies. So um, cool. So that's SDR, BDR role. Let's, let's walk into um, what are the potential career paths after this? So um, let's start with the one that is most common and the one that is available at the most number of organizations and the one that most companies want you to say in the interview process that you're interested in doing next. And that is the account executive role. So um, this is a role where you're just like going even harder into a sales role. You're um, trying to develop your sales skills even more. Um, and you're also trying to make the most money. So um Think about it like this, like, again, if you want to go over an overview of what these, what these like roles are, if you go to that part one video that I mentioned earlier, it talks about this. So think about the SDR, BDR is finding those good potential customers, getting them initially interested. And then the account executive does the work, however long it takes to get this potential customer to a paying customer. They get the one, they get that potential lead to sign that deal. Um, you know, maybe that takes a week, maybe it takes a month, maybe it takes, uh, you know, a year. Just depends on how complex your software is to integrate, how big your um, potential deal size is. Usually the bigger the deal size, the longer it takes to close. So the more expensive your software, the longer it takes for the potential lead to say yes. Um, so what's cool about like taking this sort of path, um, really this is the role with the highest earning potential and um, this is um, this is sort of the role where if you want to be a head of sales one day, um, like th um, I would highly recommend you get closing experience as an account executive. Um, that that's a common trait I've noticed in all heads of sales. The leader of the sales organization is at some point they did have closing experience because you know because um, um, yeah, that's a really vital vital role to to any sort of tech sales organization. Um, so um, so let's kind of talk about um, like within within being an account executive, there is like tiers. So I'm gonna pull up my friend's profile, Andrew. 
and we'll just talk about it through um, through his career path. So um, Andrew actually is a friend of mine. Um, we uh, went to Michigan State together. Um, he is the first person I convinced to get into tech sales, like when I first got in. Um, so I've been, I've been loving doing this for, for a long time now. And yes, I'm using his LinkedIn. I'm too cheap to pay for premium. So, um, you know, here we are. So um, let's talk through it. So you can kind of see here, okay, he did that entry level BDR role, did it for about a year and a half. And you can kind of see he's been an account executive in these different tiers, right? So let's start by talking about this SMB role, right? Day one, as an account executive, you are not going to sell to, you know, the McDonald's of the world, the biggest companies in the world, right? You're going to start by selling to um, younger organizations. So SMB basically means small to medium sized business. So um, it'll be dependent on the organization that you're in. But generally, let, let's say that's like zero to 100 employees at that company or zero to like 200 ish. Um, and really, like in this role, you're just going to get initial reps. And what does it take to get to convince a CEO to sign a deal? You're going to get um, these deals will close fast because they're smaller deal sizes, right? Because you're selling to smaller organizations, so they can't they can't pay as much. So um, you're going to be in lots of deals, which means you're going to get a feel for all of the different types of deal dynamics, right? So or all, all the types of deal situations, right? So. What do I mean by that? An example would be um, a competitive deal, right? So it's like you and a competitor trying to um, trying to um, uh, sell this lead on, on buying your product instead of the competitors. Maybe um, you're in a build versus buy deal, right? So that means um, is the cons is the lead considering buying your software or are they considering building it internally with their own developer team? Um, let's do one more. One more would be, um, huh, let's see. Um, one more would just be like, um, trying to create urgency, right? Maybe there is no, um, maybe there's no like sort of initiative on their end for why they would consider buying your software, right? Like at the end of the day, people buy, like people buy SaaS tools, SaaS products because they're trying to achieve some goal. And the SaaS product helps them do that, right? So um, let's think of an example. An example would be like, let's say it's the company's goal to be more organized that that year, right? Like they are just um, they are always missing project deadlines, and projects are always being pushed back, and they're never completing them on time. So they set a goal of this year we're going to complete instead of completing fifty percent of projects on time we're gonna complete 80% of projects on time. Then if I was a company like um, Asana, which is like a project management tool, then I have a really great chance of selling this company on my software because they have an initiative internally to solve this issue of making projects run smoother, getting them across the finish line faster. And Asana is like built for that, right? So that's why they would buy our SaaS tool. So, Let's say you're in a scenario where there is no initiative internally. Then how do you how do you create that urgency within the buyer to um, to buy your software? Maybe it's um, maybe it's like giving them a discount or uh, or you know some other stuff. You know you'll you'll sort of game plan this stuff with with your sales manager as well and, and other account executives. So you'll get initial reps as a SMB account executive and compensation here. Um, is in the range of you know 120 to, to 140k, so um, pr pretty great, um, and that that's that OTE number. And um, one thing I'll call out here is now the base bonus split is much more aggressive. Now your base is 50% and your bonus is 50%, right? Because so when you make this jump to account executive. Your base really isn't going to increase that much. Maybe it'll increase like 5, 10, 15K, but the majority of your compensation increase will come from your bonus because they're trying to incentivize you to close deals. If you remember from part one, I talk a lot about how tech companies need to grow fast, right? That's why they get all of this funding from venture capitalists because these venture capitalists have this expectation that you will grow to be worth billions of dollars within the next 10 years. So, um, 
So yeah, so that that func- that trickles down all the way to you as an account executive. They want to incentivize you to close to close deals, drive revenue, help the company grow fast. Um, so um, yeah, so you'll be in that role. Let's say like one to two years, um, one to two to three years, depending on how well you perform. All all of these promotions are dependent upon you performing well. Um, so that's that role. And then, um, you know, where you can go next is, um, mid-market account executives. So now these are slightly larger companies, right? Let's say in the range of 200 employees to, to a thousand employees. So, um, with more complex deals, um, that means the deal sizes are bigger. That means you get compensated more. So, um, compensation for these roles is in the range of like 160 to like a little bit over 200 K. That base bonus split is still 50-50. That's just how it'll be with account executive roles um, for all of them. And um, and yeah, I think you, you can expect to be in this role two to four years. Um, you'll see here, Andrew uh, was in this role a year. Um, part of that's just timing. Um, a lot of, um, all these companies will have career growth opportunities for you, but sort of like, um, whether it happens, whether that promotion happens in a year versus two years, um, is not only dependent on your own performance, there's things outside of your control, which can kind of suck. Um, like, uh, you know, an example would be, let's say, um, let's say, um, I was an SMB account executive and I'm trying to become a mid-market account executive. If the mid-market team, the, the existing mid-market account executive team if they're not performing well as is, like they don't have enough deals to go around to all of the account executives on the mid-market team, then it's not necessarily likely that you'll get promoted within the next few months to that team because they need to figure out the issues there first because just adding you would spread those deals even more thin and um, would reduce everybody's ability to hit quota. So. Um, that's a big part when it comes to promotions is, is the next team you're getting promoted to, um, do they, um, do the right conditions exist to where you can get promoted? Um, so, you know, um, so yeah, so that's something to keep in mind is it's not always in your control and no one can really guarantee, oh, this'll happen in one year. This'll happen in one year and three months. It's really like it, they can they can tell you that hey like there's a career growth path and you can see that with people at the company by looking at their LinkedIn's but you know it's it's hard to know you know a year out if it'll exactly happen then. Um, so um, what do we want to chat about here with mid market deals now like you're not just selling to the CEO um, you're selling to like multiple stakeholders right um, so maybe that's also like the head of engineering. Um, the head of marketing. It just depends who you kind of sell your software to, but there's more more decision makers involved in the process because the company is bigger and um, that's how decisions get made at bigger companies. It's just more people are involved. Um, so you'll get better at like sort of pitching to all these different people's needs and, um, and yeah. And then, um, cool. So you do that role for let's say two to four years, something like that. And then um, enterprise account executive can come your way. So this is um, this is the role where now you will sell to the biggest brands in the world. Think the McDonald's of the world, um, you know, the, the, the biggest brands in the world that you know, the Fortune 500 companies. Um, so compensation here is in the range of, let's say, you know, 200, 250-ish to like 350-ish K. Um, but really, like from what I've heard from account executives is... The goal isn't to like just hit 100% of your quota. And again, that's true for all these roles. But as an enterprise account executive, this is when compensation can get a little bit crazy. So um, let's say you close one or two deals as an enterprise account executive. That is what it takes to hit your quota, right? Because selling to McDonald's or whatever, they have a very, very long um, process for how they go about buying software. So those deals are huge. So like closing only one or two will help you hit your quota, but like those deals are going to take a long time and they'll take up a lot of your time. Um, but what I have seen is with enterprise account executives, sometimes the stars will align. Let's say, you know, every, every three-ish years, every four-ish years, 
the stars will align where they don't, um, they're not just going to close one or two deals. Um, they have the chance to close like four or five deals or five or six. And when that happens, um, as an enterprise account executive, you can have a high six figure, low seven figure, um, salary year compensation year. Um, and I've seen this multiple times. Um, one example was, um, there was, um, when I worked at this company, SIFT back in the day, we actually, um, there was this competitor of ours called a uh, smite and, um, you know, it was, it was insane out of the blue. One day we came to the office and, uh, this company smite just said, Hey, we're, we're getting acquired by Twitter and we are shutting down today. We're shutting down our service. So there was all of these companies who are using their software um, for really like urgent, urgent things like on a daily basis who are like, what the fuck? Like, what do we do now? We, we need that service. So um, lots of those people actually um, reached out to us, reached out to me because I was, um, I was working on a product that was, uh, I was basically selling a product that was a competitor to, to Smites. We had a lot of different products at Sift. So all these people started reaching out to me and um, I passed it off to this account executive. This account executive had like all of these deals and um, we closed some like huge, huge names. Um, I don't think I can say the names, so, you know, that sucks. But, um, but yeah, like think, uh, I'll say this, think to the most widely used uh, messaging app for like gamers. Like that's an example of one. Um, and, uh, or a service where you can, um, get like tasks done for you, right? Like around your house. Um, another example is like this, um, this publication where lots of, lots of individuals and creators post their, um, post their content to, it's like their blogging, um, blogging site. So these huge names who had a ton of traffic, um, you know, this, this account executive was able to all close them within, within that year, got pretty lucky with the like fact that she had all the leverage and, uh, yeah, she had, I'm pretty sure like uh, a seven figure year that year. So, um, so yeah, so enterprise account executive can be awesome because you can make a lot of money and, and kind of just in any of these roles, you can make a lot of money, but, um, it can get pretty bonkers in this enterprise world. So, um, cool. So that's kind of that career path there. Um, few things I do want to mention on downsides with this role. This can be a high stress role, right? Because 50% of your compensation is dependent upon you like performing and like hitting your quota it can be stressful at times when, when you're, uh, you know, not hitting your quota or, um, you know, if you, if you crush it one year at the end of that year, then the, um, it just restarts, right? And that next year your quota attainments back at zero and you got to restart again. So that can be stressful. Um, parts of the role is like you, um, you're reliant on others, right? So there's variables outside of your control. So one example is as an account executive, the deals that come your way are based on, you know, how part partially how good your SDR or BDR is. Are they sending you highly qualified opportunities or are they just sending you shit? And, um, that like, if you're, if you're sending, if you're getting shit from your SDR or BDR, getting shit, shit leads, then like you just, you have to do it on your own. So like you have to add on all this work. So something to keep in mind as a SDR BDR is, um, uh, make sure you hook up your account executive, make sure you're doing good work for them and not screwing them over with shitty deals and like just hoping they accept them because as a SDR or BDR, you're compensated. Your bonus is compensated on you sending leads to your account executive that they say, yes, this is a legitimate lead. Um, when they say, no, it's not a legitimate lead, then you're not getting compensated on it. So I've heard many stories. I've seen it myself of many SDRs sending shitty leads to account executives and then like saying to the account executive, why aren't you accepting it or whatever? Think of this as a relationship where like you want to give, you want to give a lot to your account executive and that in general, that account executive will give back to you. Sometimes there are going to be asshole account executives, but, um, but yeah, think about how like you take ownership over creating a symbiotic relationship there. Um, so that's one variable outside your control as a account executive. Another would be, um, 
you know, what else? Um, let's say you're at a younger company, at a younger startup. Um, you could join a company where, you know, the product just isn't that far along. So um, when you talk to prospects, um, all the things that they want just aren't there yet in your product. And, you know, that's outside of your control. Um, you know, I, I'd say like the economy is partially outside of your control um, in the sense that, oh, like when the economy isn't doing well, um, there's a chance for you as an account executive to not do well. But uh, I'll caveat that with at the end of the day, like people are going to buy software. People still buy software in a downturn. Um, so like top performers are still going to perform well. So um, I wouldn't use that as an excuse. Like companies do get tighter in downturns, but I still see top performers perform well. Um, they don't really make excuses. So, um, so yeah, so those are some of the variables. Um, yeah, cool. So uh, let's say you're like, okay, that role is like hardcore sales, very stressful. Like I, I want a little bit more of like a chiller tech job, um, but you still want to be in sales. You still want to be selling in some form. Then consider an account manager role. So this account executive, they get the person to, they get the lead to become a customer, right? But then once this customer is now a customer, now using your product, someone has to manage that relationship and make sure that customer is happy and kind of upsell that customer on like newer, newer forms of your product or more expensive forms of your product, whatever they may be. So that's this account manager role. So it's more amicable with the lead, with, with the with the customer, right? Because there's more trust built now. They're they're using their product. They're using your product. Hopefully, they love it in general. You know, they're they're liking it. So, um, it feels a little bit more relationship building and a little less like transactional and selling. Where as an account executive, it's just like um, you can you can kind of be pretty annoyed with with um, your leads you're dealing with and all that kind of stuff still possible as an account manager, but generally, generally those relationships are a little bit better and, um, a little bit more friendly. Um, so, um, what do I want to touch on here? Sorry if you can hear my niece crying in the background. She's going through the terrible twos right now. So, um, yeah. So, uh, what do we want to talk about here? So career path, um, it's similar to what I described before. Um, let me pull up a few of my friends' profiles. Um, so, um, so it's similar to what I described as an AE in the sense that you'll work with smaller, uh, smaller customers at first, and then over time you'll work with bigger customers and eventually get to enterprise and, and all that good stuff. Um, so, yeah, what else? Um, and then sort of on the compensation front, the way to think about it is it will be in general um, about 20 to 40K less, maybe not 40K, 20 to 30-ish K less at each level compared to an AE. So, um, so yeah, so that's something to bear in mind as well. So, um, so Lauren's one person, I worked with her at SIFT. She was on the BDR team with me. Um, and uh, yeah, you can kind of just see here uh, her, her career path went from a BDR, was an account manager, and then um, you can see here, she did that role for two and a half years and then worked worked on bigger bigger accounts, right? Um, and then um, you can see she got into sort of management as a team lead. Um, so she was sort of managing some of these account managers. Um, so it's one role, one path. Um, Joe's another example. He's an epic seller. So... Um, he, uh, you can kind of see here, um, and we're not talking too much about like sales management roles, um, for account executives and account managers. Um, cause I could just go on forever, but yeah, generally after you become like the top form of an account executive, like an enterprise account executive or an enterprise account manager, then you can stay as a individual contributor where it's just, you're focused on, um, on your own output. Or you can become a manager, right? Where you are managing these sales reps, these individual contributors, and instead of you selling directly all the time, you're just supporting them and um, helping them work through their challenges. Maybe tag teaming that tag teaming deals with them from time to time, um, and you can kind of see that he took that path where he became, you know, a director of 
account managers and you know here as well he's doing that so um so yeah so that's cool um what are some of the com cons with this role sometimes as an account manager you will start your relationship with your customer and it doesn't start off on the right foot and it's because let's say uh the ae like oversold the product right they promised x y and z and those things aren't true and then you have to pick up the pieces so that can be kind of frustrating, um, internal, you know, dealing with those internal politics within your organization. Um, another thing um, that's a con is um, not as much earning potential as the AE. Um, and yeah, that, that can kind of, you know, depending on what, what goals you're optimizing for, um, that can suck, right? It's not to say you can't make a lot of money as account manager, um, you will. But, um, you know, I've seen, generally speaking, account executives, their, their average pay, median pay is higher. So, cool. So that's that. Um, so then, let's talk about a solutions engineer. So, um, with every account executive and account manager, think of them as, like, the quarterback for the deal. Um, they are... They are making sure that the deal get, or even like a project manager, they're making sure the deal gets to the finish line. They're making sure the deal gets signed. They're making sure the customer is happy. But that doesn't mean that they will like do everything. They will instead utilize resources around them, other people around them to bring them in as needed, right? So a solutions engineer is generally like that sidekick on every deal with an account executive and account manager. And that's that person who is still there. They interact with customers, but it's less focused on like selling you and, you know, pitching or whatever. And it's more so focused on the product and being more technical, making sure they're integrating it properly and using it properly. So what's cool about this role is like, um, you know, what, what people like about it is they still get to interface with customers. They want that interaction, but it's just less focused on like closing and being a hardcore seller. So, um, that's that. Um, one thing I've noticed as a con for this role is that, um, you know, is that I will look at a SE's calendar and like that day is just fully booked. So generally an, a, a solutions engineer is working with multiple account executives or manage or, or helping multiple account managers. So um, their days sometimes seem like fairly exhausting because they're just on like meeting after meeting after meeting. Um, and they get like no time just to like not be on meetings during the day. But hey, maybe like you don't care about that and you're into that. So um, career path, same concept, right? You, you over time work with bigger and bigger customers um, and then compensation, um, I think it's generally in the sim I've seen it like, uh, I've seen it generally in the similar range as, as account managers. Um, but, um, yeah, that's, that's kind of that career path. Um, and then, oh yeah, I wanted to show you a few people who, um, took this career path. So, um, let's chat through Avic. Avic, love this guy. Um, so you can see here, he was on the BDR team. Um, and then he, um, support engineer, solutions engineer, they're similar, um, support engineer, like maybe they're just like answering one-off questions that a customer will like put into your helpline, help, help, you know, help desk. Um, whereas the solutions engineer is more so like working, actively working on a deal and is like interfacing with that customer on zoom meetings. So um, this is just a little bit more of a critical role where these are like a little bit less critical. It's like one-off questions that aren't as difficult to answer or handle or whatever. Um, after this, like he could have, he could have stayed in the square path. So you can kind of see with, um, with Yoav, that's the, that's the career path he took was he stayed a solutions engineer, worked bigger solutions engineering deals, became a manager. And now like, you know, he's, he's just taking that path. Um, and that's awesome for him. But um, you can see AVIC, so, some organizations will have this sort of, um, it's not like common, but like if you do good work within the organization and network within the organization, this this career change is possible where he was on the sales side, right? This is like the sales team, 
And then he, he jumped over to the product and engineering team. So this, like, he's not interfacing with customers every day. More so, he's, like, managing the product and moving it forward and working with the engineering team to, like, ship new features that customers want. So, um, yeah, so that's that career path there. Um, now let's talk about um, an SDR manager. So um, let's say after the SDR role, you're like, damn, like, I don't really care to sell and I don't really care to, like, be on calls with customers all day long. I've actually enjoyed mentorship more and, like, helping the younger SDRs on the team. Then maybe this career path is for you. So you stop selling externally and you just help SDRs within the company reach their potential. Um so um, what's cool about it is like, uh, it can be really fulfilling, right? When you help someone young in their career who is super ambitious and works super hard and like takes in feedback, it's really awesome to see them grow over the next year. That's why I started Tech Sales Mentors because like I love helping people that like want to be helped and like put in the work. Um, but the cons of it is um, you can deal with like immaturity, right? You can deal with not serious SDRs, right? Um, there is this uh, concept in our industry that I've heard, um, which is basically that SDRs are shitheads. So um, lots of SDRs will come into our industry and then like leave because they realize it's not for them. And um, frankly, like some sometimes because like, okay, it's legitimately not for them. But other times just because like, you know, what I've seen is like, it's someone straight out of college and maybe they don't have a lot of responsibility in life, um, a lot to lose, and they're still in that college mindset. They're maybe showing up to late at work, like a little bit late. I did that a few times, uh, straight out of college. Maybe they're, uh, getting too drunk at like a company event. Um, maybe they're just like not taking ownership over their quota. Um, maybe they're like being a goof in the office, whatever saying st stupid stuff like um in the company slack that's where like you you message employees um so like if you're a manager of that kind of person that can be kind of frustrating dealing with that immaturity and and annoying um so that's one of the cons um another one of the cons well you can view this as a pro or con but like your performance is now dependent upon um your team's performance, right? The SDRs around you. So you still have this base bonus. I believe it's like probably like, I think like 60 to 70% base, 30 to 40% bonus. Um, and on the salary, it seems like it's similar to, to account manager that I referenced up here. So, um, so that's all cool. Um, but yeah, like you got to make sure your team is performing well. You got to make sure you're training them well, setting them up for success so on and so forth if you want to perform well. Um, so um, so one person's career path I want to go over is Emerald. She was my SDR manager and uh, she was a legend. She basically, um, she, uh, I remember one point like um, she took me aside and she's like, what are you doing? Like you're not acting serious. Like you are kind of being like a SDR shithead, like step it up. And um, I really appreciated that from her because she was great at striking that balance of being, um, like being serious when necessary, but like still like making you feel like you were friends and, um, my one-on-ones with her weren't always like work focused. Um, and, uh, yeah, she's just a great manager, great manager. So that's something to consider like on this career path is, um, as important as, um, I think it's very important to join like a really solid tech company, right? That are, that are backed by great venture capitalists, that Silicon Valley-esque tech startup. But you want to really get a feel for your manager during the interview process and understand if you'll vibe with them or not. And if you don't, like if you guys aren't on the same wavelength on like how they coach people or um, or their personality and like what you look for in a manager, um, then you probably want to avoid that because like like this person is um, really like your first mentor in the in the actual role. So I've seen plenty of SDRs where they've had a manager 
and um, it's just like made their life hell. And and that can be true of any role, but like this first role is really important because like. You don't want to get that first bitter, sour taste in your mouth because then you may sour yourself on this entire industry when there is a lot of great things ahead lying for you. So really make sure you vibe with them. Um, but yeah, kind of, you know, touching on Emerald's career, you can kind of see she went from um, like being a, like sort of this manager versus director thing. All it means is like when you're a manager, you manage sales reps. Um, when you're a director, it means you manage managers, right? So like when she was a director here, she had an SDR manager or a few SDR managers under her or here at Snowflake, Snowflake's a huge company. So she probably has like three, four, five SDR managers under her. And then under those SDR managers are, are their reps. So, um, so yeah, so that's cool. Um, what do else I want to talk about here? Um, one thing I've noticed also with this role is just um, be careful. Um, if your goal is to be a head of sales one day, um, it's difficult to 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 go from a SDR manager to head of sales. Again, you want to have that closing experience as account executive if your ultimate goal one day is to to lead a full sales organization. Um, so those are all like the traditional career paths. Um, I just wanted to briefly touch on one that like isn't really related to you know, your comp joining, uh, a, a, you know, another role at your company. So, um, I'll call this the not tech sales role. So maybe you're getting into tech sales cause like you want to be in tech, um, and you just view like tech sales as your entry path into like this world, but you don't really want to do tech sales. Maybe you want to be a founder one day. Maybe you want to be like an early employee and just like work on all different types of things. Um, then um, take this route. That, that's what I did. So like, just to briefly touch on my career path, um, I, um, I did the SDR role at SIFT. Um, and then I was, I was on my way to getting promoted to account executive. And then I realized that, um, wait, I actually don't want to do that. Like, I want to be a founder one day. Like, how do I do that? Um, so Kind of, I think like the way to go about this is um, you you want to like be in like when you're in the when you're in this role you want to do really good work you want to get known as someone who is serious and crushes it and as ambitious and just like is a great worker and um, when you do that um, you will get future opportunities that will come your way so I'll talk to that in a second. But um, you also want to meet interesting people in your field, right? So, um, like, it's much easier if you're in a place like San Francisco or New York City or Austin to do that. But, like, let's say you're remote, then, like, maybe that just means, like, you're on Twitter. There's a huge tech, communi tech community on Twitter. Maybe you're on LinkedIn um, and, like, you know, you know conversing with, with people. And that, that could be, like, posting it could be just like in the DMs and, and stuff like that, whatever it may be. So that's what I did is like I did good work and then I met interesting people and that's how I got connected to my next opportunities. So um, I uh, worked at Ali Capital and Ali Capital is basically run by these two brothers. The brother that I worked with uh, was Suleiman Ali and basically I saw it as a chance to, um, I wanted to be a founder, let me learn how to be a good founder. So um, Suli had um, started multiple businesses um, before, like he, he basically, when he when I met him, um, I met him at like a poker game one night, he, he took all my money. And then a few weeks later, I was figuring out that, I figured out that he needed a first employee for his new startup. And I was like, this is perfect because uh, when I looked at his profile, um, he had started a few companies and, um, and like a few, uh, tech companies and sold them for, uh, lots of money. So he was starting his third company and I saw it as a great chance to just learn how to be a founder. So, um, I did that with him for a year. Um, and then sort of, um, this opportunity with Calixa, this opportunity, um, was, um, was with someone who was at SIFT previously. So the CEO of here, Calixa, he was previously the head of product at SIFT. So when he was starting Calixa, 
Um, basically he's like, ah, oh, hey, like I need a salesperson like to sort of help me like get advice, um, on like what I should be doing on that front. So who he asked was, um, Emerald. So Emerald, who I touched on earlier, Emerald and him had like a long work history together. So, um, what do you call it? So him and Emerald, they both worked together at, uh, Twilio, right? So you can see there at Twilio, they were t Twilio. And then you can see she was at Twilio. Um, and then they also worked together at Sift. So there was trust built there, right? So, you know, Thomas asked, asked Emerald, Hey, who, who should I basically, um, who should I, who should I hire here? And, and Emerald recommended me, right? Cause she knew I did good work. She knew these were my interests. So that's a way you can get connected to like super interesting opportunities. Another example would be like our head of sales. Um, our head of sales at Sift um, was Zeeshan. And when he joined Netlify, I remember uh, like he hit me up on LinkedIn. He's like, hey, what are you doing? Hey, you want to come join, join our company? Um, so do good work, meet interesting people, get on their radar and like interesting opportunities will come to you in this industry because... Um, you know, tech, tech employees will leave their job every like, let's say two to three to four years. And when they go to that next opportunity, they're looking to recruit amazing people. So be someone who's amazing at your job and you won't need to do like bullshit networking. Um, good networking is um, doing good work. And um, I, I chatted a little bit about that in a post, but can't find it, whatever. So, um, so yeah, so that's what I wanted to talk about there. And then, um, oh yeah, and then, you know, after after I did all that, then I eventually became a founder and, you know, doing that now and it's awesome and it's great. And, um, and like all the connections I built up uh, through this time, I'm using them to like help push forward the mission of tech sales mentors. So all, all of this stuff, all of these relationships compound over time. So don't, don't think in a short-term mindset in terms of, like work or your career, think like five, 10, 15, 20, 30 years out. And, um, and yeah, like it, it'll be, it'll be great for you. So, um, so cool. So I kind of just like talked about how awesome your career can be after the SDR role. Um, and that's probably like, you've probably only seen good things about like the SDR world, SDR world, tech sales world. I want to get honest about it now. I want it. I like, there are great things about it, but I want to also make you aware of like what sucks about it. There's trade-offs to anything. So let's talk a little bit about that. So um, let's start talking about what sucks. So the daily grind of inputs. Um, on most days, you'll have to make like 50 cold calls, send out like 25 cold emails, um, take a lot of notes on like meetings you're on. Um, you just have to show up every day and like, go. And, um, like, I think early on that's going to be really exciting, but man, some days you're just going to be exhausted. And, um, like I was saying earlier, like nine months in, you know, I was pretty exhausted with the role and ready for something next. So that can kind of suck. Um, constant rejection. So, um, yeah, let's say eight out of the 10, eight to nine, seven to eight to nine out of the 10 leads you reach out to will not respond to you or say unsubscribe or say, how did you get my contact information or be like, how dare you reach out to me? Um, so there's actually, um, there's this guy, he has very satirical, funny posts in our industry called, um, his name's corporate bro. So just, uh, <laughs> just Google unsubscribe corporate bro and you can watch some funny videos. Um, and maybe scare yourself away from this industry. Um, just kidding. Um, so let's talk on the next thing. So next thing is, um, leads can be assholes sometimes. Kind of like I just talked about, they can be pissed off. They are reaching out to them. Like, how'd you get my contact information? Or even if you do get them on a call, they're like, um, I just want to talk to the account executive. I just want to close this deal. And like, you have to, you have to qualify that person before you can do that. You have to make sure they're legitimate so they can be annoyed by that or they can think like they're better than you or whatever. Cause like, you know, oh, you're selling to them. You're the salesperson and they're the person who decides like if they buy or not. So that can be kind of annoying dealing with people who are like cold or assholes as, as customers or leads. Um, not hitting quota. Um, either that's like during the quarter, like you're behind on your quota and you're just like, fuck. Um, every week, 
we would, at the end of the week, we would all meet as a SDR team and we would all go over our numbers of here were our inputs, right? Here's how many emails we sent and here are our outputs. Here's how many meetings we booked. Here's how many of our meetings got accepted by account executives, which is how your quota is tracked. Here's how we're tracking against our quota. So there were weeks where, um, sorry about that. Um, so there were weeks where, um, you know, there, there's going to be weeks where people are going to perform way better than you. Right. And, um, there's going to be weeks where like you're crushing it. Right. But don't get on this roller coaster, stay even keeled. Right. Um, you know, stoicism, it's, uh, this philosophy changed my life and really helped me like deal with the ups and downs of a sales career. Um, so check out this guy, Ryan Holiday Stoicism, if you want to learn how to be more, more calm through, through the stress. But, um, let's say it's like halfway through the quarter and you need to be at halfway through the quarter. You need to be at 50% of your quota and you're at 20% of your quota. Everyone's seeing that in that meeting, every rep who's like your friend, um, every rep who you don't like your manager is seeing it. Um, all of this information is also transparent, right? Um, like, uh, anyone on the sales team can access this information. So that, that can be kind of like that transparency can crush some people. So, um, that can kind of suck or like it's the end of the quarter and you didn't hit your quota. So you're not getting paid as much as like you were expecting that can suck. Um, not getting promoted as fast as you like. Um, when I was at the one year mark at SIFT, I was like, why am I not promoted yet? Um, and every SDR does this. And, um, what I'll say is just like, um, it never, generally speaking, it never happens as fast as you like. Generally it'll take two to three to four to five months longer than you want to just because sometimes timing sucks. Sometimes it's great. Sometimes it sucks. Um, so yeah, so that, that'll probably happen. Um, and then the power dynamic with, within this organization. So you're new to this industry and because of that, sometimes you're going to be like naive um, maybe you're new to like the corporate world is what world. Sometimes you're going to be naive to this stuff and people are going to take advantage of you. I've heard examples of like managers, SDR managers, just like steamrolling, um, SDRs and just being dicks to them. And that sucks. That's not always like, that's not every SDR manager, but like, there's always a chance for a micromanager. So that can be kind of shitty. Like your first job in tech, like experiencing that. So again, use your interview as a chance to like get to know this person and, feel out their personality and do you vibe with that type of personality or not? Um, but also no, there's like lots of opportunities in tech. So if someone's treating you like shit and you don't see a path to like a, an improved state. Like there's lots of good companies out there. If you're a good performer, um, AEs, AEs can definitely be dicks. They can, they can, um, you know, reject your opportunities. They can when when they shouldn't be, they can ask you to do things that like isn't in your scope of responsibilities. Um, they can give you like unsolicited, uh, maybe not unsolicited feedback. Like maybe they can give you feedback, but just in a really dickish manner. Sometimes, yeah, sometimes AEs are like not cool at all. Like they, they take advantage of that power dynamic, that, that power dynamic that um, um, isn't really like there, but they just like impose their will. So um so yeah, so be aware of that. If any, like you're going to deal with some of these challenges for sure. So talk to people who are more senior than you, more senior SDRs who you trust. Talk to like AEs you trust. If you trust your manager, talk to them. Um, you know, if you're in tech sales mentors in, in our company, like you can always hit us up and, and we're always helpful. Okay, so that's the sad stuff. Okay, ready? All right, now let's talk about the good stuff. So um, what's great? So the talent in like the best tech startups is amazing. And the fact that you get to work with these people and learn from these people is amazing. So uh, let me, let me talk, let me give you like a few examples. Um, and Neil was someone who just like, man, when he came into our company, um, the way he operated, like just, uh, was just on another level. The way he, oh, this is not him. <laughs> um, too many Anil Kumars in the world. There we go. Um, the way he, uh, first of all, his like background's insane. He, you know, did, uh, did his MBA at MIT undergrad at Columbia 
and then um, you can just see all of these places, um, whatever. He was in like private equity beforehand and then made his way into tech and uh, worked at some pretty game-changing companies. Atlassian is like a huge public, com huge public tech company now. I worked with him at SIFT. Um, basically, you're just going to pick up on how to do good work from all of these people, right? So one thing about Anil was when we would start a meeting, if someone wasn't taking notes, he would stop the meeting and be like, okay, uh, who, who's taking notes here? Um, and like, he, he would do it sometimes. It wasn't like a power thing. He was just making sure we're tracking what's being discussed, what are the action items, what are the next steps, who's responsible for what. Um, if people weren't like highly energetic in the meeting, like you've probably been, I don't know if you've been in a meeting where like just the energy's down. He's like, okay, everyone like, it just feels like we're not, no, no one's bringing it. So like, let's all just like take a second and like, like get pumped up and like, let's bring it. And um, man, like just the way he runs meetings is how I try to run them now is just like getting shit done. Um, so learning from him was awesome. Another person I learned a lot from was like our head of sales. Um, this was a guy who like taught me, um, like how you display confidence and like, and, and power within an organization. Um, and, um, and it was just through observing him. So, you know, you're probably going for a remote role. If you have the chance to go to like an in-person role in San Francisco or New York or Austin, I would highly recommend it. Like you will do better work um, or you will get better at work faster and you will become a better seller faster. Not possible for everyone. So I understand that. But if you have the chance, like take advantage of the chance that like I sat right across from this guy and um, I could just hear him speak on a daily basis, how he conducted himself, what he thought about, what questions were in his head. Um, I also like, um, I sat five seats, five seats to the right of me was our CEO, right? So like I could see how he thought and, and all that kind of stuff. So, um, so yeah, so like the chance to like learn and work from like senior leaders who are right next to you, um, is, is awesome. And not even senior leaders, like they're, they're epic account executives, um, and SDRs you can learn from. Like Marcus is an example of someone who I worked with. Um, he was, um, he was uh, an account executive when I was a BDR and I just saw the hours he put in and um, like he would just take calls from his desk. Most people would go into meeting rooms and like take customer calls. He wasn't scared. He'd take it right at his desk and um, you could just learn how he ran customer calls and uh, the work he put in. And uh, you know, you can see he's built a pretty epic career as well. So, um, so that's awesome is the people you can work with and learn from. Um, and also future opportunities come from, um, it can be an uncomfortable environment, right? Like, um, after one month you're live now, you're talking to leads, you're talking to directors of engineering, you're talking to CEOs, um, that's uncomfortable. And if you embrace that uncomfort, there's going to be a lot of personal and professional growth for you. Um, and, and then you'll master the role, right? In nine months. And then a few months later, you'll become account executive and then Oh, boom, uncomfortable world starts again and you got to figure out how to be an account executive. So I think for me, that's exciting. It's like personal growth and professional growth. Um, the people are cool. So um, you, um, there's this fine line. Tech companies, tech startups, they um, can have very, um, they can make it seem like everyone's like buddy, buddy, right? So like they'll have these happy hour events. They'll have these company offsites in like Vegas or Hawaii or whatever, like once a year. Um, and it can feel like, damn, we're having a good time. We're like drinking, all that kind of stuff. And that can be cool, but uh, be, be careful, be careful. Uh, you don't want to commit what's called a CLM, a career limiting move, where uh, you're the one who's too drunk at that event. You're the one who's blackout at that event. Um, you know, I would always recommend if you are someone who drinks and you decide to drink at these events, you never get past the point of like tipsy. Um, you know, the only only times I would recommend is like if you're with like your close group of friends at the company you trust, right? There was a group of SDRs who are like, who, who I worked with back then, who are like my lifelong long friends now, right? I go to their weddings, that kind of stuff. Like I trust those people with, with everything, right? Um, so those people I'm okay with like, not only like alcohol, but like being more honest with and, and more trustworthy with. But 
in general, like, people are really cool. Um, there was, um, um, my friend Michael, um, he came from a finance background in consulting where work 80 hours, very cutthroat sort of industry. And he was talking about how, um, at the start of one of their all company meetings, like someone came up with a song and, um, about the company and just started playing it like on their banjo. And so that's kind of weird, but like, like, oh, a company is doing that, but that's also like cool. So you'll notice these sort of like weird, cool, fun perks with, with these companies. Um, and there you can bring more of your personal side to the company, but again, there's a line. Um, remote life is great. Um, you know, my, um, one of my friends who I helped get in the industry, um, she would, um, some days like she would just, and I wouldn't recommend doing this within your first four, four or five months. Like those first four months when you're still trying to prove yourself, like be on during business hours and just crushing it. But once she established like trust and people knew like she did good work and she was performing well, there were some days where like from 12 to two, 12 to three, 12 to four, she's like, it's, it's not on right now. My, my work ethic is not on. I'm going to chill and watch some gossip girl. And, uh, it doesn't mean that she didn't work, but like, it just meant like, okay, like later, like 7 PM to 11 PM or whatever, uh, she, she turned it on when her motivation was higher. So that's one thing that's cool. Um, another thing is like, if you're a parent or something like being able to like, you know, uh, take your kids to, to school in the morning. Um, being able to like see them when they come home at like 2 PM and, um, spend time with them or like, you know, take a break from your desk and like go chill with them downstairs cause they're on spring break or whatever. Um, so cool. Um, what's great. Uh, another part is just like software. This is the industry of our generation. If you look at the companies that are growing the fact fastest and becoming the largest, it's tech companies. And, um, if you look over time, like 1900s, 1800s, 1700s, there's always been an industry that was the industry of the generation where that's where people ought to made money, um, made a lot of money. And like, that's where it was easy to make money. So there's a really good quote where it says, um, don't, don't be in, um, don't be in a desert trying to find water, right? Just go to the ocean and find water. So like, be in an industry where there's lots of growth, right? Where, you know, these companies are growing super fast because it means they need, they need to hire lots of people. Those people are getting paid really well and their careers are growing really fast. And if, if you notice from any of the LinkedIn's that I saw today, um, those people's careers trajectories like accelerated. They had to perform good work. Of course they have to perform well. That's always number one, but, um, but it's not like, um, another industry where you perform really well, but like your industry's industry is dying no matter what. So like if, uh, you know, you're great in the newspaper industry, that's cool. But like your industry isn't like, you know, growing. So like, where's the money to be made? Um, and then, yep. I, I just mentioned that last part, career growth to perform well. Um, so that's awesome. All right. So let's finish up here we're, we're, we've been going for a while now. So let's talk about a week in the life of an SDR. So um, let's talk about the time breakdown first, what, what it's breaking down in between. So, um, I'd say about 50% of the time, um, this is, this is for me and what I see generally, um, 50% of the time is on outreach, right? To, to new leads. So maybe that's cold calling, maybe that's cold emailing. That's, that's what I talk about when I'm saying that daily grind of inputs. It's like sending out these emails, making these calls. Um, 15% of the time is prospecting, right? So that's, um, finding potential companies that are a good fit. Um, in part three, I talk about how to prospect. So make sure you watch that. Um, finding good, good people at that company to reach out to, right? The right people. You don't want to just reach out to anyone. You want to reach out to the people who would, um, care about the problem you're solving, the, how, how it would fix their day, right? You wouldn't, you wouldn't sell sort of a, finance product to someone in HR, right? You would sell a finance product to someone who's in finance. 15% um, of the time is like actual customer meetings. So let's say you, you send out those cold emails um, and like, let's say you send out a hundred cold emails and five of them turn into customer meetings, then okay, that's that 15% of time here of customer meetings where you'll have what's called a discovery call. So a discovery call is where you will 
qualify that person. In part one, I talk a little bit about quali qualifying someone, but basically it's asking them questions to understand, are they a good fit for what you're selling, right? Like, um, is like, for, for instance, this is a, this is a common one in SaaS is medic. Um, so some of them are like, I for identify pain. Is there an actual pain, a problem your software can solve? Um, e, economic buyer. Who's the person who's going to be buying the software so we can make sure we, we involve them in this deal? Stuff like that. Um, and uh, so you qualify them and then you'll briefly pitch them on your software, like briefly sell them on it, how it can solve the problem that they mentioned. And then, um, yeah, if they're interested, then you'll pass them off to an account executive. Um, and then 20% of the time it's like internal meetings. Maybe that's a meeting. It's called one-on-ones, like a meeting with your manager, a meeting with other SDRs at the company, um, maybe a meeting with the account executive. Maybe you partner with an account executive. That's the person who you send leads to. Um, maybe it's like a company wide meeting, a, a whole sales team meeting, stuff like that. Um, so a uh, few concepts I want to mention to have successful weeks as SDRs. Um, first is called batching. So you want to, um, like, there's these different tasks here, right? Um, and what, 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 I've, what I've heard as like a great quote is um, an SDR has to do like 200 two-minute tasks per day, right? So like there's all of these tasks you have to do. You want to batch them based on the type of task they are and just knock them all out in a row. So what do I mean by that? I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but like let's say the first 10 minutes of like doing work, you may like feel kind of slow and like you're not that into it or whatever. But like when you're in like minute 30 or minute 45, like you're in the zone, like you are just crushing your work. So that's this concept of batching is like if you need to send out 100 cold emails, um, then like, or sorry, let's say you need to send out like 20 cold emails in a day, send them all like within like a two hour time frame. Don't like send out two cold emails and then like go do some other type of task and then come back to it and then send cold emails again. Um, that's called like context switching and, um, like you're switching the type of tasks you work on and there's like a cost associated with that of, oh, now I have to like rewire my brain to what type of task I'm working on and how to accomplish this specific task. So batch the different types of things you have to do, right? So like in any given day, right? Batch your outreach into like a three hour window. Batch your prospecting into a one hour window. Batch your customer meeting into a one hour window. Batch your internal meetings into like a two hour window, whatever. So don't always be jumping from task to task. Like do one one task to its like full completion. All of those tasks within that that bucket or that category. Um, time blocking. So um, people are going to put shit on your calendar. They're going to put meetings, um, meetings you didn't ask for, meetings that are unnecessary. And uh, sometimes like you can't really get away with it. Like, like you have to generally go to these meetings, but you kind of decide by um, how you schedule your calendar, what times they can, they can put, right? So one thing I've noticed that's very effective is um, like a SDR will put on their calendar from like 8 to 11 a.m., like um, uh, DNS, do not schedule, like outreach, right? Cold outreach. So then they know no one's going to interrupt them with meetings during that time. No one's going to make them contact switch into a meeting. They can just focus on getting through all of that cold outreach through, through the day. So um, that'd be one, one example is like time blocking. Um, I'd probably, I would, I would get advice from your manager on, you know, what's acceptable because... Um, some orgs are like weird about, you know, setting big blocks of time, but, um, but yeah, I've seen it to be very effective. Um, and once you definitely establish more, uh, trust within an organization, once you've demonstrated performance, you can like definitely start to do this. Um, look at where your time is being spent. So I've audited SDRs calendars and I see like, you know, um, they're like, I'm not hitting my quota. So I'm like, all right, let's look at your calendar. Let's look at where you're spending your time. And I'll look at their calendar and I'll just see like a ton of one-on-ones with like SDRs like every single day and account executives. And it's like um, sometimes these one-on-ones can be useful. Sometimes they're a waste of fucking time. 
So, um, really be, um, really be mindful of like where you're spending your efforts and how is it helping you accomplish like, uh, goal number one. And what's goal number one? Goal number one is SDR is hitting your quota. How do you hit your quota? You do outreach, you prospect and you do outreach. Um, so make sure that's number one in terms of where your time is being spent. The last thing is just on a weekly basis, like I find it good to reflect on what I'm doing and then game plan for the next week. So as an example, um, I will, um, I, I mentioned what outreach was in, um, in part one, part one video. So check that out if you aren't familiar with it, but every, like what I'll do is I'll just sort of look at my performance, right? So I'll look like, okay, what percentage of people are opening my emails? What percentage of people are applying to my emails? Where, like, where did I not perform well this week? Okay, why did I not perform well this week? Um, okay, if it's open rate, like maybe my subject lines suck. I need to improve those next week. If it's reply rate, maybe that means the content of my emails sucked or I'm not targeting the right type of people. So, you know, that's what I mean by like reflection. So doing that kind of stuff. Maybe you can look to your other peers, other SDRs around you and see where are they performing well? Like, where are they getting opportunities? Oh, okay, let me look for those types of companies. Or, um, you know, uh, maybe my calls are sucking. Oh, okay, let me go into this tool called Gong, which records all customer calls, and start listening to reps who are like crushing their quota. Let me listen to their calls and see how their calls are doing. So just reflecting on like, hey, where is the bottleneck in my workflow? Where am I not performing well? Um, and, uh, and then, yeah, going about like setting a game plan of fixing that in the next week. Um, so here I just wanted to, um, I just like, like roughly walk you through what a day could look like. Um, so sorry, I can't really zoom into this. So, um, yeah, so hopefully you can see it, but, um, kind of like, okay, start of the day is like in back, inbox processing. Maybe that's, um, you know, responding to any potential leads who uh, replied to my emails. Cool. Like they want to set times. Cool. I'll respond to those. And then nine to 12. Okay. Focus on outreach, doing those cold calls, doing those cold emails. All right. I'll do a lunch. And then maybe I have an hour of customer meetings. Then, okay, I'm doing more outreach. And then end of the day, I'm like back in my Gmail. I'm doing inbox processing and, you know, setting, responding to any emails I got from customers. So, um, this would be, in general, like this would be my Monday through Thursday would be like, you can see what's it focused on. It's focused on getting me potential leads, getting potential leads onto calls with me and then taking leads uh, or sorry, um, taking calls with leads because I want to hit my quota. That's my number one goal. That's your number one goal is SDR. So that'd be Monday through Thursday. And then here would be my Fridays. My Fridays would be like, okay, like I went hard this week. Now, like, let me have a little bit more of a chill reflection day, do different types of works. Again, like this concept of like batching work. So, all right, start my day with inbox processing, go through my Gmail, um, respond to customers or leads. Um, and then, okay, I'll start the day um, reflecting and uh, reflecting on my week and um, game planning for the next week. And then, okay, I'll do some one-on-ones and team meetings. Um, you know, maybe through that I can, um, I can um, like talk through what, I, what I'm what i planning for my next week. Like, oh, I figured out this issue and like, I'm gonna try to solve it in this way. Like, what are your thoughts? Like, have you felt, have you ever encountered that issue? And maybe I can refine, refine my game plan from that. And then um, you can see here this big block for prospecting. So. Usually I'd use the last part of Fridays as a chance to get all of the potential companies and all of the potentials, potential leads I plan to reach out to over the next week. So then again, the concept of batching, I don't have to worry about it Monday through Thursday. I can just focus on doing outreach. I don't have to worry about, oh, I got to prospect and find more leads, right? You want to focus on batching your work and like getting it done, um, not context switching all the time. So this is like an ideal, these are ideal days. There's going to get shit thrown on your calendar that'll like, you know, fuck it up a little bit. But in general, like, here's how um, I recommend you structure your, your days and your weeks. 
Okay, so uh, that's it. Um, so let's talk about next steps from here. Um, one, I would recommend that you um, uh, gain, gain, gain credibility with employers, right? So you're trying to get a job in tech sales, um, add the certification to your LinkedIn. They, they will look at your um, LinkedIn when you know, you're applying or whatever. So um, the way to do that is just um, if you don't have the um, if you don't have like a license and certification section on your LinkedIn already, click on add profile section, add license and certifications, and then type in the name of this, which is um, a career path in tech sales. Um, so you can do that, a career path in tech sales. Um, so do that and then issuing organization, tech sales mentors. You can put that issue date if you want, doesn't matter. Then hit save. And then um, what you wanna do is then share it. Share it to your network. Um, make sure employers can see this um, even easier. Um, so, so yeah, and then you just hit post. Um, and then, yeah, if you feel like it, you can also like write a few things that you learned in the course, right, to show that you um, really understood this stuff. So um, that's what to do there. Um, Please share this with your friends who are trying to break into the industry. Like I want as many people to get this free training as possible. I don't want them to have to like pay these tech sales boot camps thousands of dollars just to like learn what tech sales is. So please share it with people. I'd love that. I'd really appreciate that. Um, and then uh, last part, next steps. So you watched me a lot. I just talked a lot. Okay, now now it's your turn to like do something. And, you know, I'm not going to check your work, but again, like, you know, I won't be disappointed. Sorry, I won't be upset. I'll, I'll just be disappointed if you don't do it. So, you know, this is the honor code. So, so please do it. So um, just answer these two questions, right? Like for yourself, write down uh, what you, like how you've been able to handle these challenges that I mentioned up here. Write down like how you've been able to handle like a daily grind of inputs, like a high volume sort of high task role, how you've been able to handle constant rejection, how you've been able to like handle adversity in life, like not performing well, how you've responded to that. Um, answer those questions for yourself. Think of stories. This will help you because those are, those are going to be the questions you're asked in SDR interviews. So start to think of those, start to write those down. Um, and then the second part is like we walk through the career path, what you can do post SDR. Talk about like, um, write down what you want your career path to be and talk about why that aligns with your personality and what you want. Um, the truth is, is that like, um, interviewers are gonna ask you this question in three to like, what do you wanna do in three to five years? And um, if you don't have this answer down, like they're gonna be like, ah, this person hasn't really thought too much about this career path. So you really wanna show you're committed to this career path. Um, and then hint, hint, um, generally what they want you to say, like you can say whatever you want, any of these, but generally what I've seen is they want you to say account executive. So bear that in mind. Doesn't mean you're like held to that um, and you have to become account executive, but generally that's what they want to hear because generally that's the most common promotion path at these companies. They may have these other ones, but um, yeah. So, um, so yeah, so that's all I got for you. So do that stuff. Please, it's for you, not for me. I'll be fine either way. So if you want to get a job, do that kind of stuff. Cool. Peace.